Hi, I'm David. Welcome to Westby. Ready to take the next step? You are invited to join us for dinner on Sunday, August 27th at 5 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall to learn more about our vision, beliefs, expectations, and membership process. Additionally, we will explore ways you can serve through our ministries at the church. Child care will be available. Reserve your spot at connect.westby.org. Mark your calendars now. Our next business meeting is Sunday, August 13th at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. Prior to the business meeting, all ministry teams will meet for a time of fun, fellowship, and training beginning at 4.30 p.m. in the fellowship. School will be starting soon, and that means our Wednesday night programming will resume on Wednesday, August 16th at 6.15 p.m. Mark your calendars now and plan to join us as we launch activities for all ages. Come join us for our upcoming worship night on Wednesday, August 9th at 6.15 p.m. in the sanctuary. We'll be singing some awesome songs that'll lift your spirits and focus on scripture and prayer. Bring a friend along and let's have a great time together. Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together.
Then I saw the beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns, with ten crowns on its horns. And written on each head were names that blasphemed God. This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. They worshipped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they also worshipped the beast. Who is as great as the beast? They exclaimed. Who is able to fight against him? Then the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God, and he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all the people who belonged to this world worshipped the beast. They are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anyone who is destined for prison will be taken to prison. Anyone destined to die by the sword will die by the sword. This means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently and remain faithful. I remember pulling the book off my dad's shelf when I was in the third grade, and I have no idea why he let me read this book, but he did. The cover had this giant bird claw um, that was coming out of the sky and, and creeping down and, and hovering like a cloud over a small church. Now. This book had tremendous impact on me, and frankly, it freaked me out. I was a third grader. The book was This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti. It was a work of fiction, kind of in the horror genre, a Christian book, but it made me realize that spiritual warfare is real. In Revelation 13, two beasts rise, one from the sea, which we'll talk about today, and another beast will rise from the earth, which we'll talk about in the next video. Now, who are these beasts, and how are they related to the dragon in Revelation 12? We'll answer that question here in a moment. Last week, we mentioned how there was a, there is a heavenly war, and this heavenly war was occurring even as Christ Jesus was born. And as we looked at in Revelation 12, the dragon, or Satan, tried to stop the birth. It makes sense that he would try to stop the birth of Christ. And then when Jesus was born, he tried to steal the child. But God saved this whole you know, birth scenario, and Christ ended up coming to earth in the flesh saving the world. In Revelation 12, we see the battle of good and evil at Jesus' birth. That's the first coming, the incarnation of Christ. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. But in Revelation 13, we see the battle of good and evil right before the second coming, which is when Jesus returns to earth to judge the living and the dead. Now, in a spiritual war, which we are in, in a spiritual war, there is no neutrality between light and dark. Either you're on one side or the other. There's, there's nothing in between light and dark. It's either light or dark. Either you are for Christ or you are against him. In Luke 11, Jesus drives out a demon, and it amazes everyone. They start asking this question, who has this power? Some claim that you know, maybe he struck a deal with Satan, and that's how he has this power. And Jesus reminds them that a house divided against itself will not stand. And Jesus tells them how 
He will overcome the strong man, as he says, which is Satan. And then we get these words in Luke 11, 23. Jesus says, anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Here's the bottom line. Satan wants to destroy you, but God wants to save you. There is a battle raging, and we're in the middle of it. Now, I came to realize this in the third grade when I read Frank Peretti's work of fiction. Now, it was good for me, and it ended up making me realize that, hey, this is actually occurring. But this battle, this spiritual warfare, it came to earth after rebellion in heaven. Satan, the lead angel, led other angels to rebel against God. They, they fell to earth, and, and Jesus says, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a lightning bolt. This battle is now among us. There's rebellion against God on earth now, and it, there, there is a battle for souls. Revelation 13 is the beginning of the end of the story. These are the last few battles. And in Revelation 13, it's very clear. Either you will be on God's side or you will be on the side of the Antichrist. You will either be marked by 666, as it says in verse 18, or you will be in the Lamb's book of life. You'll either worship the beast or the Lamb. You will blaspheme God or you will champion his name. Now, I don't, I don't have many nightmares. Um, I, I do dream. Some of you, like, dream all the time. My, my wife, Erin, she, uh, she has very vivid dreams. She talks in her sleep. We've had conversations in the middle of the night until I realized she was actually a, asleep. She sleeps very deeply. I tend not to sleep as deeply, so I don't dream as much. Uh, and, you know, on occasion I will, and there are times that I've had nightmares, just like many of you. Um, but it's pretty rare. But when I do have a nightmare, there's this recurring theme. Maybe some of you can relate to this. I don't think I'm the only one. You know, the, the nightmare is something awful is about to happen, whatever it is. And I know it's going to happen. I have foresight that it will happen. And I, I, I have a desire to stop this awful thing that's about to happen. But for some reason, I can't stop it. And then the awful thing happens, and, and I, I feel guilty for, for not stopping it, even though I tried, and then I, then I wake up, and I realize it was just a dream. And I still feel guilty, <laughs> even though it was just a dream. John here receives this nightmarish vision. I don't know if he felt the way that I felt when I have a nightmare, but this is a future view. Unlike my dreams, which are, you know, fiction, John gets a dream of the future. And this is a this vision that he receives is real. The beast in Revelation 13 is the Antichrist, the one who is against God. Now let, let's talk about this. The, the word Antichrist does not appear in Revelation, but it does appear in other parts of the Bible. And, and there's a clear connection in Scripture here. So, he's called the little horn in Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. He's called the ruler or the prince in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Uh, Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica uh, refers to um, this person as the man of lawlessness. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then John, who also wrote Revelation, um, writes in his letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, particularly 1st and 2nd John, he calls this person the Antichrist. So, even though the term may not appear in Revelation, clear connection throughout Scripture, this is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is a term in Scripture really referring to four concepts. Now, this is important as you consider Revelation chapter 13 and the end of days. So, there's four concepts here that connect this thing that is the Antichrist. It can be an evil political power. That's the first thing. We find that in Revelation 13. Uh, 1 John 4 refers to the Antichrist as the evil spirit of the age. So, a political power or just the spirit of the age. Those are two things. The third thing 
is uh, people who are forerunners to the final Antichrist. In 1 John chapter 2, it says there will be lots of other Antichrists leading up to the one Antichrist. And then, as we see in Revelation 13, the fourth way that uh, the Bible talks about the Antichrist is the, um, the just the embodiment of satanic power in one person. And that's what we find here in Revelation 13. Now, all of this makes sense. I mean, if we think about it, you know, this idea of the Antichrist being a political power or a person, well, both those things, both of those things are often connected even today. Um, you know, when you think of Nazi Germany, you think of Hitler. When you think of Hitler, you think of Nazi Germany. When you think of North Korea, you think of Kim Jong-un. I mean, the idea that a person and a political power would be connected, well, that's obvious. So we have this description of, uh, of a beast in Revelation 13. And the reason that we have this description is not to decipher who he will be, but instruct us on what to do when he actually appears. So at the end of Revelation 12, the dragon stands at the sea and waits for the beast to rise. So this is Satan waiting for the person to come that he can influence. And this is um, the person who will emerge from the nations. And the, the beast has seven heads. So we know that this is a coalition of nations. There's 10 horns with 10 crowns. So not only a coalition of nations, but a convergence of power. And the beast looked like, it says, a leopard with the feet of a bear and the mount of a lion, mouth of a lion. So here we see um, the leopard, which represents the Greek empire, the bear, which represents the Medo-Persian empire, and the lion, which represents the Babylonian empire. And John is writing that this world power that forms uh, with the beast uh, is going to be even greater than the ones of the past. But there's something even more fascinating here that occurs in Revelation 13. Did you pick up on this as you heard it read? If not, read it again. Take a moment and read Revelation 13. A counterfeit resurrection will be one of the telltale signs of the Antichrist. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded, it says, beyond recovery. But in the, then in verse 3, there's this apparent miraculous recovery. Now, the word wounded here is the same Greek word for slaughtered, which refers to the lamb, Jesus. So, we'll talk more about um, Revelation, the, the second part of Revelation 13 next week. But in Revelation 13, 14, um, it tells us that the beast seemed to come back to life. And the Greek term here is the same one used as Jesus' resurrection in Scripture. How will the beast gain power? The beast will gain power with a counterfeit death and a counterfeit resurrection. Why? Well, to gain counterfeit worship. Verse 4, they worshiped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they worshiped the beast. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed. Who is able to fight against him? Now, what's really happening here? Satan loves to blaspheme God, to steal God's glory. What better place to steal than the resurrection of Jesus. Now, how will anyone believe this? How can people fall for such an obvious trick, a counterfeit death and a counterfeit resurrection? There are, the, people are already falling for it. Some of the most popular preachers globally are some of the greatest charlatans. It should not surprise us that people will fall for this. They steal God's healing. They steal his miracles. And Satan will try to steal Jesus' resurrection and use that resurrection to coalesce power. Now, will this be a resurrection of a political power or a career? Will it be a fake assassination attempt? Will this be some sort of medical recovery? We don't know, but we should be watching for the signs. And then we learn in verse 5 here that for 42 months, for three and a half years, 
um, the Antichrist will gain more and more power, and wonder will be turned to worship. And this is a good principle for us today, because what you all, what you wonder at, will become your God. Now, maybe you're thinking this sounds so dramatic. Well, one, it is. I mean, Revelation is written in a certain style. It's apocalyptic in nature. And so, yes, it's dramatized, but we see this today. People, let me give you a quote. This is from Ron Heifetz. Uh, he, he's not a Christian writer, but he writes about leadership, and he, he writes about how people fall for the ploys of those who are seeking political power. I love what he's, here's a quote from him. He says, people in the position of authority are often faking an answer because they're in a position where they're expected to have an answer. Those people are in a straitjacket because those around them expect them to have an answer and know what to do. So again, that's Ron Heifetz. He's a professor at Harvard, one of the top leadership scholars in the U.S., long respected leadership scholar. And he, he talks about this leadership straitjacket, which actually sounds very dramatic in and of itself. And, and here's, in essence, and here's, one, here's what his theory says. He says, you know, these leaders will say, these leaders that are seeking power, they'll say, well, give me authority and I'll fix your problems for you. Give me power and I will give you resources. And, and Heifetz says that this exchange is common and it doesn't work. He's right. The Antichrist will attempt this very tactic. Give me all of the power and I will solve all of your problems. Throughout history, how many times have people worshipped lies? And all the people who belong to this world worshipped the beast. They are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life that belongs to the lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. We've, how many times have, have people fallen to, to obvious and empty promises? Well, Satan, the dragon, is behind all of it, as it says in verse 4. We read Revelation, and it's understandable to react to texts like this one. You're like, how could this possibly happen? You know, it's, it's an understandable question. You know, how does this happen? It's the same stuff that's been happening for centuries. I mean, look back to Daniel, what happened with King Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a, had a dream about future kingdoms of the world, and the statue that he dreams about is huge, it's shining, it's made of fine gold, it's silver and bronze. It's quite an impressive sight. But in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel also had a dream about the future kingdoms of the world. But in Daniel's dream, it's more of a nightmare. They're frightening, they're filled with terror. And the lesson in all of this, the difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, is that anything we build on our own is destined to fall apart in horror. And that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. It was something he thought he could do on his own to coalesce all this power. But then it was what happened. It was crushed to small pieces. Daniel's dream is the proper dream. When, when we think we can do this on our own, it's all going to fall apart. So what the beast will build will be impressive at first, but it will ultimately fail. So during the tribulation, there, there will be persecution, and especially in this time period between Revelation 12 and Revelation 20, which I believe is about three and a half years, you get this first beast that, that rises out of the sea. That's the beast we're talking about today. Next week, um, we'll talk about the beast that rises out of the earth. So there's two. We'll explain more next week. But during the tribulation, during this time period, when we see rising power of evil, what do we do? Well, the Bible's clear. We endure. Revelation 13.10, this means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently and remain faithful. It's the same theme that we find in 2 Timothy. So let me take you to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm just going to read you five verses here. 
Here's what Paul writes to Timothy. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God, be prepared, whether the time is favorable, favorable or not, patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given to you. Well, that day is here. Now, am I saying that Christ is, Christ's return is imminent? I don't know, but I do know that we're living in that time period. Be prepared. Keep a clear mind. Don't be afraid of suffering. These are themes that we find not only in Revelation, but in 2 Timothy 2. Work at telling others the good news. Fully carry out the ministry God has given for you. It's a theme that's found throughout the Bible. I think of the prophet Amos and what he said. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure. We are not at ease. <laughs> we are at war. God's word leads us into battle. This is what happens when we follow Jesus and when we pick up our crosses. We find ourselves in a spiritual battle. I solemnly urge you. Here's what Paul is saying. Here's your orders. Proclaim the message. Go and fight and tell. Jesus is the commander-in-chief. He's in charge. Not any man, but Christ himself. Not the beast, but Jesus. Jesus is the message. It's all about him. And Jesus is the one who has the victory. So we want to get on the right side of the battle. Revelation 13 speaks of this political power and the first beast that rises out of the sea. There's another beast that rises out of the earth, and we'll talk about that in the next video. The first beast is a political power. The second beast is one of a religious power. Don't fall for the tactics of Satan. Don't fall for the dragon who's trying to deceive you. What we need to be doing is falling in love with Jesus, who is our Savior, who is our Lord. And because he is our Lord, he is going to tell us what to do. And he is very clear. There is a battle to fight. Life may not always be easy, but with Christ, it's always worthwhile. You can withstand the end of days. Whenever those may be, you can withstand the end of days. And Christ will be the way that you endure. Thank you for worshiping through our digital service. Please visit us at westb.org for more information about our church.